This is the second message in a summer series here at First Baptist Church where I thought I would just take July and August to go through a little bit of, uh, well here, if I just say the title and the subtitle, it should all come together, right? If I did my titling correctly. (laughs) And if you drove in, actually, you might have seen it on our marquee. Church, what's the point? Boy, that puts me on the hot seat, doesn't it? (laughs) Church, what's the point? Uh, But, you know, I wonder sometimes if in church life, maybe we all ask ourselves that question. Do we ever get, maybe, it could be personally, it could even be a church as an organization. Do we get off track and we might ask ourselves, what is the point? But the subtitle to this series in July and August is Rediscovering God's Purpose for His Church. And so this is the second message in the first message. Uh, The title of the first message last week was The Church That Jesus Builds. The church that Jesus builds, and we especially emphasize Matthew chapter 16, the great confession, where Peter, and as Jesus teaches us in that passage, it was revealed unto him only by the Father, Peter confesses that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the Son of God. Upon this confession, Jesus says, I will build my church. You know, in Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul saying goodbye to the Ephesian church. And in Acts chapter 20, I believe it's somewhere around verse 28, double check me on that, Paul refers to the church that God purchased with his own blood. So the true church is whose church? It's his church. Now, it's okay if in the vernacular you talk with friends and family and you say, you know, at my church, we had just VBS, you know. At my church, you know, we do this and we do that. That's okay. It's okay. But whose church is the church? He purchased it with his blood. It is his church always and forever. I've been reading a book lately, which I might refer to later on in some messages coming up this summer. It's, a, it's an interesting little book by a guy named Gordon McDonald, and the title of the book is Who Stole My Church? And it's a, it's a fictional story of a woman who, not, not a woman, but a church, but I'm going to refer to a woman's comment in the book, a, a church that is going through cross-generational struggles, and, and the subtitle of that book is What to Do When the Church You Love Tries to Enter the 21st Century. And it's a fictitious story of of a group of people who are struggling because they're multi-decades long members in this church and the young people are coming in and the worship services are changing and things are changing. And there's a character in the story, her name is Yvonne, and Yvonne, she says in these meetings after there's been a really strong, this is all fiction, y'all, I'm just sharing with you what the book says, so no insinuation, okay? But the setup that the writer says is there was some big, strong congregational meeting conflict, and so the pastor calls, a, it's calls it a discovery group. He calls them together and says, let's talk about our issues and problems. And this character, Yvonne, she says, I just feel like someone came in and stole my church, and I want my church back. And... Though it's a fictitious book, actually, the, uh, Gordon MacDonald, who writes it, has had over 40 years of pastoral experience. He's actually uh, uh, serves as, uh, is it the provost of Denver Seminary? Uh, though it's a, it's a fictitious book, he just, he strikes a chord. And in one of the first discovery group meetings, he shares that Acts 20, is it 2028? 20, Am I getting the verse correct? Thank you for checking for me. That... Uh, God purchased the church with his blood. And Yvonne, in the story, comes to a realization. She realizes, she says in the book, you know, I realized it's not my church. It's God's church. And maybe the person who's stealing it is God stealing it back because we haven't done such a good job with it. Then by the end of the book, 230 pages later, Yvonne gets the last paragraph in the book. 
And after a lot of change, and after a lot of searching scripture, and after a lot of coming to what is God's real plan for his church, she says, I did get my church back. But she realizes it wasn't based in her preferences because the church is all about Christ. If anyone's struggling with things like that, I recommend this little book for you. (laughs) Who Stole My Church? You might get the answer, God. (laughs) You see, because God purchased the church with his blood, and God is jealous for his glory, Christ alone is head of his church, we are only people in his body. The church is not mine. It is his. So we're discovering through this series, maybe I should say rediscovering, what is the kind of church is that the church that, that Jesus builds? And last week we talked about the greats of Scripture, the great confession. That's Matthew 16 where Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see, the church should be made up of people who make that confession. <laughs> that, what makes, that is what makes a true Christian church. There's also the great commandments Throughout the Gospels, when Jesus is asked by some of his uh, adversaries, what is the greatest commandment? And he responds by quoting Deuteronomy 6 and also Leviticus, that you shall love the Lord your God with how much? All. Your what? Heart and soul and mind and strength. So our faith is meant to be a faith of full commitment of heart and full commitment of mind. And strength. God wants 100% of all we are. That's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. That you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he says upon these two commandments, hence the great commandments, hangs everything. John Piper once said that in the span of all eternity, as if in space, God nailed up on the wall of space these two commandments commands. Love the Lord your God. Love one another. That's the church that Jesus builds. Based upon the great confession, based upon the great commandments. And then there's one more great in scripture. The great commission. Upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Matthew 28, also in Luke 24, also in Mark, is it 16? Also in John 20, 21. All authority in heaven and on earth, the resurrected Savior says in Matthew 28, 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the church that Jesus builds. It is a church on mission. It is a church that confesses Christ. It is a church that loves the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It is a church that loves one another. And it is a church on mission to glorify and to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. This is the church that Jesus builds. Today, we're going to go through the church that Jesus uses. And and this is, again, this is one of those sermons where... uh, I used the joke last week, and it's, it's, by the way, it's printed in your bulletin if you want to follow along. You see nine points there. Uh, this was actually a nine-sermon series back in 2016 here at our church. So I'm going to do nine sermons in one. And the joke I used last time was how uh, Billy Graham prepared seven sermons, and he got up, and in ten minutes he preached all seven. That was his first sermon experience. You can read about that in his autobiography. Um, but what I want to do is I'm going to go quickly over about the first 13 chapters of the book of Acts. And yes, it's going to be quick. It's okay, y'all. Take a breath, but do pray for me. Uh, And I'm going to go quickly, and we're going to to cover what's inside your bulletin there. And I'm going to just tell the story, the biblical story of how the Holy Spirit, after the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, birthed and brought together the church. And in this story, I want us to see some elements which I've printed out there in the bulletin for you about the kind of church that Jesus uses. And we're going to take it straight out of Scripture. And I'm simply going to ask, because I think this is the model of a New Testament church, what we see here in the book of Acts. 
I think, it, I think because the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the scriptures and because it's the history and because it is a fulfillment, by the way, Acts 1.8, a lot of people consider that a missions passage. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. You see, Jesus spoke those words right before his ascension in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And then upon his ascension, we have that incredible, beautiful, powerful story of how the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles in Jerusalem. And they, they speak with various languages to over, and counted in the scriptures, so it's a minimum, there's probably others there too, to over 16 different languages. They speak the gospel of Jesus Christ, and 3,000 people are saved, and the church begins. It's powerful. But I, I'm going to ask us, as I'm going to story through this pretty quickly, I want you to see some nine elements that I've taken from the text of the book of Acts of the kind of church that Jesus uses. It's biblical. It's a model. And it will also stand as a scriptural mirror, maybe a double check, to answer our series question, church, what's the point? And to answer our series subtitle, Rediscovering God's Purpose for the Church. And so work with me, and the way you can work with me is as I'm going through the text, have your Bibles open to the book of Acts, and as I reference scriptures and we go through it quickly, you can kind of skim along and follow this amazing, wonderful story. So here's what happens, Acts chapter 1. Jesus appears to his apostles. In verse 7 it says, It is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed for his own authority. See, after his resurrection they said, Now, now, now is the time. You're going to bring your kingdom? And I, I love his answer. Eh, it's not for you to know. But what is it for you to know? Verse 8. And as I've already just quoted this, You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. Now a lot of people, if you memorize that verse, which I hope you do, in Awana, I love our Awana children's program. Kids memorize this verse, I hope they do. But there's something that, it took me years to figure out. Once I figured it out, I couldn't, I couldn't forget it. Did you know that when Luke wrote the book of Acts, that Acts 1.8, it is Jesus' prophetic utterance upon his resurrection, but it is also very literally, in terms of the organization of the whole book of Acts, it is also the outline of the book. In Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit comes, and Peter becomes the, the main spokesperson at Pentecost, and in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit comes, we're going to see how the Holy Spirit comes in power in Jerusalem first, from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 6. Then in Acts chapter 7, Stephen is going to get martyred. Oh, you see, we were comfortable hanging out in Jerusalem. Everything seemed fine. The Holy Spirit visited us. Everything was good. All of a sudden, Stephen, the first martyr. And from Acts chapter 7 to Acts chapter 12, you can follow the church history of how the Holy Spirit then, upon the martyrdom of Stephen, scatters the believers throughout Judea and Samaria, and everywhere they go, they take the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. You see, but that was already outlined in Acts 1.8 for you. And then what about the remotest parts of the earth? In Acts chapter 13, the church in Antioch, the Holy Spirit moves the church and the people to identify the apostle Paul now, who was converted in Acts chapter 9, and Barnabas, and raises them up and calls them out to be missionaries. The church in Antioch lays hands on them and sends them out. And from Acts 13 to Acts 28, we follow Paul's missionary journeys throughout the known world of the time. So Acts 1.8 is actually... An outline for the book, it's a prophetic utterance of Jesus. You will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you and then you will go and do this. You'll witness in these geographic areas. And then you read the rest of the book and you realize what Jesus said was true. It happened. It's awesome. So here's what happens first of all. The church that Jesus uses, watch how it's born. In Acts 2, and again, I'm going to have to just Go quickly over this. When Peter and the apostles receive the utterance of the Holy Spirit to speak in chapter 2, verse 6, that every one of those there gathered 
could hear in their own language. So this speaking in tongues is not a babbling speaking here in this chapter. Not at all. It is that they had this gift to speak in the learned tongue, unlearned to them. That's what makes it the Holy Spirit gift. But it's a known language. And they were proclaiming the gospel. And, and, and as part of Peter's speech, he says something extremely strong and wonderful there in Acts 2, 22 through 24, towards the, the middle end of his speech Men of Israel, Peter says, at the day of Pentecost, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, did God know the crucifixion was going to happen? Yeah, he planned it. Did God deliver over his son? Yes, he did. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Verse 24, but God raised him up again. Wow. Putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So here you have thousands of people gathered on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem after Christ was crucified and risen again from the dead and they hear this message of Peter, which I'm Just going quickly over. And then look at this in verse 37. When they heard this, when they heard what? Uh, Go back up one more verse. Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter, And the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent. Repent. And each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The church that Jesus will use, and we're going to see more of the way God uses, Jesus uses his church in the book of Acts as we move forward. But the first step is this. The gospel is proclaimed And those who hear the message of God's salvation in Jesus Christ, they come to a proper human response. What's the proper human response? What do we do? Not only did the apostles say it on that day, but the scripture says it now today here in this room. What is the first step of a church that Jesus will use? Repent. Did you expect that one? Of course you did because it's up on the screen. But what I'm saying is, is this is not the typical marketing strategy of a lot of churches today. What I'm saying is, is this is not a fluffy duffy thing. What I'm begging and what I'm baiting, I'm I'm, I'm admitting to up front that I'm trying to bait us as a church to get closer to God and closer to scripture. But what I'm saying is this, I cannot stand up here as a pastor of a New Testament church and try to sell people a health, wealth, prosperity gospel and a comfortable lifestyle in Jesus Christ without the first step, which is what? Repentance. Church, what's the point? What is God's, how do we rediscover God's plan for the church? Maybe we should start with letting it be God's church. Maybe we should start with turning away from all of our sin. Maybe we should start with coming to Christ, the cross, and the resurrection above all things. Maybe we should start with putting down all our programs and just repenting and coming to him. Do you want to be used of God in your life? Do you want your church to be used of God for his glory? then we must first of all understand. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him Lord and Christ. It's always, forever, past, present, and future about him. That will be the church that Jesus uses. Not a church that makes it about me. Not a church that makes it about us. Not a church that makes religious or Christianity stuff about stuff. Repent. 
and be baptized. It's time. You know, during the Reformation, some of our forefathers and foremothers, the Anabaptists, 500 years ago, it was so difficult for them to even practice baptism that some of them were martyred for practicing the act of believer's baptism as taught in Scripture. And now today, we have people who claim to be Christians who won't even submit to believer's baptism. Repent and be baptized for Christ. Start there. Start there. But it gets better because watch what happens. This is what happens. The promise is for you in verse 39 and for your children and for all who are far off and many, as many as the Lord will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. How'd you like it if your very first church started on the first day with 3,000 people? Wouldn't that be cool? That'd be awesome. Now, for sake of time, yeah, did you ever hear that illustration? The little boy in the church says, Daddy, the pastor just took his watch off and set it on the pulpit. What does that mean? And the daddy said, nothing. <laughs> but let's keep going. Watch what happens. Now I'm gonna, I gotta fast forward, and I'm gonna ask you to, this is a worn out bad old joke, but listen fast but I want you to follow through the scriptures. So here, the church is born, and the scripture that we read at the beginning is Acts 2, uh, 42 through 47. And what did that church do? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They had fellowship. They broke bread. They had prayer. They were of one mind. They were praising God, that's worship, and they were in favor with uh, the community, in favor with all people. That's verse 47, and then the Lord was adding. See, that's why I'm saying the title of this message is the church that Jesus uses. You see, in verse 47, it says the Lord was adding to their number. If you have to do marketing to add people to your church, you're leaving God out. I remember the day, I said I was gonna go fast, but now I gotta do another illustration. I remember the day when a seminary professor said, if your marketing strategy works just as well in a Mormon church and in a Jehovah's Witness church as it does in your Baptist church, then it's not from God. That's just marketing. Hey, let's do God's church God's way and see what God will give. Right? So look what happens. They give themselves to the apostles' teaching. Where is the apostles' teaching contained today for you and me? Where is it contained today? For them, they had the privilege in Acts chapter 2 that the apostles were right there. Wouldn't that be cool? Hey, come on, guys, let's go listen to Peter teach. Wouldn't that be awesome? But Peter's in glory with the Lord today. So what did he give us? What did John give us? What did Paul give us? Where can we devote our lives in like fashion to the apostles' teaching? Are you devoted to this book? See, that's point number two. The church that Jesus uses is a church full of Bible-centered, Christ-centered, God-centered followers or disciples. They devoted themselves to the teaching. And here's what happened. Uh, One mind, repentance and baptism, public worship, and even evangelism began. And the Lord was adding to their number. And then you get to chapter three, point number three. Um, Chapter three, point number three. Trust God's provision. Well, things seemed to be going well for a short period of time, and then a healing miracle happened. Of, of the lame man at the gate called Beautiful. And you would think that just because a healing happened that everyone would be happy, but they weren't all happy. And so some persecution begins. So even though there's a proof that God is working among the people, there's also powerful preaching. You see, Peter's gonna preach again in response to this miracle happening in Acts 3, 11 through 26. And let's just zoom in on verse 26. For you first, God raised up his, serp- his servant, excuse me, servant, and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. That's powerful preaching. Could you imagine a preacher saying that to a church today? I think our politically correct glossing over summary of too many things has 
has made people less bold in our age. God has sent his servant Jesus Christ and risen him from the dead to bless you by turning you away from your wicked ways. That's a good kind of preaching, though. Peter preached that way. Powerful preaching is happening. God is going to give perseverance. There's his predestined power over all of this in Acts 4, 23 through 33. So there's this event that happens. Persecution comes. He's going to answer why this man was healed. He's going to preach about Jesus Christ. And then look at this uh, uh, 4, where where did I say perseverance? Uh, 22 through 33. They're going to worship God. They lift their voices in verse 24 with one accord. Lord who made heaven and earth. Look at verse 25. By the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David. Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand against the rulers and the, uh, and the rulers were gathered together. I'm trying to go too fast. Against the Lord and against his Christ. That's from Psalm 2. For truly in the city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever, look at verse 28. To do whatever what? Your hand and what? Your purpose what? Predestined to occur. Oh, it bothers me when people sometimes say, and sometimes they're in the church. No offense. I'm not trying to point anybody out. But it bothers me when people say, do you think that... God could have done it some other way. Do you think that God could have maybe saved us by some other instrument than the cross that is so gruesome and bloody? You know, we think that's offensive. Don't you think God could just love people into heaven? Wait a second, y'all. Whenever somebody asks that, I don't want to sound critical, but let me tell you what my first thought is. You just haven't read the Bible. You just don't know what the Bible says. Because right here, look at this nugget of gold in verse 28. Herod, Pilate, the Jews, and the Romans, who are all against Christ, did exactly what? What God's hand predestined to occur. Y'all, the love of God is greater than an accident. The love of God is greater than a circumstance. God intended to send his son to the world to save the world through him, and it was all on purpose. God is not an accidental God. God is not a circumstantial God. And God is greater than the Roman Empire. And God is greater than the cross. And God is greater than death itself. And this was to glorify him and to save those who would believe. So we shouldn't come to God and say, "Boy, God, thanks a lot, but could you have done it a different way? We should come to God and say, God, you're amazing. You used all of this for your glory and for our salvation. So this is being taught, and this is happening in the church. And the church throughout all of this, when it begins to, even the healings are happening through the apostles, and and they have to account for what's going on, and then they're being persecuted by some of the leaders, and Peter keeps preaching. They have to trust in God's predestined power. That's the church that Jesus uses. We trust God's provision. I said I would go faster. Number four, unifies. The church that Jesus uses is unified. Unlike any other organization in the world, the church that Jesus uses has four unique qualities, which you can see in Acts 4 and 5. It's a unified church of one heart and soul. It's an unselfish church. In Acts 5, 1 through 11, they had possessions, and they made sure that nobody among their people was going with need, but they provided for each other. They had an uncanny expectation. If you look at Acts 5, 12 to 26, their uncanny expectation was this, that though they're put in prison, everything's still okay, because God's still in control. If you read through that passage, glance along there as I'm teaching. We must obey God rather than man, the apostles begin to say as they're persecuted and arrested. They have an unyielding ministry. So you see, the church that Jesus uses must be truly unified, unselfish, expecting God to lead us in unyielding gospel ministry. Now, as I go too fast, 
I feel like I'm losing some of the fullness of the context of the passage. Keep following along with me. In Acts chapter 6, we see the fifth point, that the church that Jesus uses prioritizes biblical ministry. And I'm going to story this one really quick. In Acts 6, we we now have a new problem where there's Hellenistic, that means Greek or Gentile background believers, and there's Jewish background believers in the church together, and there's some favoritism that happens, you see. And some of the widows from these differing backgrounds are getting some of the food, and some of the other widows are not getting the food. And so the church comes to the leaders and says, leaders, we got a problem. There's an unfair distribution of support to the widows based on their race. And the leader said, thank you for bringing that to us. We will stop everything and go help. If those of you know the story, know that I just misquoted it. That's not what the leader said. What did they say? It is not profitable for us to let go of the preaching of the word and prayer to wait tables. So the leaders gave a word to the congregation. Find some spiritual men among you who you can put in charge of this problem and then the apostles will keep preaching the word. Isn't that cool? So whenever a problem happens in the community of the new church, what do they do? Is a church defined by conflict or by Christ? We must put the priority on biblical ministry in the church always. We will still deal with conflict. We will still deal with need. But the church, the first church, the church in Jerusalem, they knew that it would not profit the entire community. Now remember, you got 3,000 plus believers. In fact, by now, you're actually going to have in chapter 4, verse 4, 5,000 plus people in this church. You see, the church knew that you can't just let conflict stop the ministry of the word of God. Is there always going to be conflict? Unfortunately, yeah. There's going to be conflict. It comes, it goes. It's around, it's around the next corner. But do you want to be a church that Jesus uses? Remember how we started out with repentance? Well, how about this element here? Do you want to be a church that Jesus uses? Then make first things first. Make the word of God the priority. Make biblical ministry the priority. Start with first things first. This is, by the way, where some churches use this passage to describe their definition and setup of deacons. And our church, praise the Lord, has a wonderful group of deacons. And they serve to help people who are in need. If you ever need me as pastor, call me. If you ever need me as pastor, call me. But the pastors and leaders of God's church must dedicate themselves to the preaching of the word and to prayer. Keep biblical ministry first. Okay, we gotta keep going because there's some fun stuff we gotta get to. Number six, see the church that Jesus is gonna use. You see, last week we talked about the church that Jesus builds. Now look at how Jesus uses this church in the book of Acts. Peter, the apostle, preaches. 3,000 repent. They're baptized. They commit themselves to the study of the apostles' teaching and the word of God. They trust God's provisions. They stay unified, and they won't let division divide them. They're going to keep the Bible and the ministry of the word of God a priority, and then they're going to also, boom, all of a sudden, Acts chapter 7, my point number 6, they're going to see itself, the church sees itself in God's covenant plan. Why do I say it that way? Because here comes Stephen. And he's one of, by the way, he's one of the guys who's raised up in Acts chapter 6 to help with the church division. (laughs) And he ends up preaching. He ends up preaching to the leaders of the day. And he ends up recounting all of God's covenant promises in the Old Testament. And he ends up coming up to the point where he centers on Jesus Christ. And they kill him for it. But it doesn't stop the church. In fact, this martyrdom of Stephen only serves to embolden the church because the church, if you follow Stephen's teaching, and boy, this is a whole sermon on its own, if you follow Stephen's teaching, he is exclaiming and exalting this fact. God's community is part of God's covenant and we will be his people. And he died for that. 
So let this martyr be a witness to you and me today. Do you and I see ourselves as part of God's covenant plan in history? Our church exists to glorify God. Our church exists to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the nations. Our mission statement as our church is glorifying Christ in worship, discipleship, and mission. This is what the church is for. Church, what's the point? Rediscovering God's purpose for the church. In the last couple generations, and I'm one of them, I've been in ministry about 25 years now, in the last couple generations, how do I say this? The commercial church of America has redefined itself to be about marketing. I don't think that's the church that Jesus uses. It can draw a crowd, but I don't think that's the church that Jesus uses. Do you know what the church should be about? There's a living God who made a covenant with you. There's a living God who made a covenant with you through the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember the story at the beginning? Who bought the church with his blood? Whose church is this? Do you understand and I understand that that the definition of church even transcends 2019 in Bettendorf, Iowa? Even transcends the name First Baptist Church? Do you understand that you are part of an eternal covenant with God? Slow down. Do you understand that if you are in the church, you are part of an eternal covenant with God through Jesus Christ? That is our identity. Stephen understood that. And that's the kind of church that Jesus will use. We proclaim the gospel, point number seven. So here's what happens. Once Stephen is martyred, remember how I said Acts 1-8 is like the, the outline for the whole book. So you get to chapter seven, and the persecution happens. It's like stomping on an ant hill, and all the ants start to scatter. But these Christians now, 5,000 of them, some of them stayed at the church in Jerusalem with Pastor James, Jesus' brother, but many of them took off and went back home but they didn't go home silent. This is beautiful. This is one of my favorite parts of the teaching. I wanna be a church that Jesus uses. If you get persecuted, I don't, it scares me that our reaction today in a lot of circumstances is if you get persecuted, you get quiet. Oh, I said something about Jesus and they got mad at me, so now I'm gonna be quiet around those people. That's not what they did. Stephen said something about Jesus and he got persecuted and the apostles, they were scattered back home so they wouldn't be killed, but everywhere they went, they didn't get quiet, they got louder. Where have you been? Jerusalem. What happened? Jesus. He's crucified and raised again from the dead. Really? What else happened? Peter. What happened? He spoke to me in my own language. He doesn't even know it. Yeah, you were saved? Yeah, I got saved and baptized. There were 5,000 of us, and then they killed Stephen. Do you know Jesus is alive? And as they were scattered, they proclaimed Jesus with boldness. Persecution does not stop the gospel. Persecution does not stop the church. You see it there in Acts 8, verse 4. Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging them off, men and women, he would put them in prison, 8-3, eight, 8-4. Eight, eight, Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. You want to be a church that Jesus uses? Go preach with boldness wherever you go. You get buffeted by the world, you get beat up by the world, you, be, go, you get told to be quiet, get louder. Be the church that Jesus uses. And I don't mean get louder to be, be loud. I mean... Does any other human being on this planet have the right to tell you to stop using the name Jesus? Not a single one. So share Christ wherever you go. Um, Point number eight. I told you this was eight. This is nine sermons in like one sermon. Y'all following along? Did I lose anybody yet? Point number eight. This is one of my favorite points. And, And we'll bring eight and nine together to a close here. Thank you all for your patience and for following along. If you want to just take this outline, a great devotion this week might be reading through the first 14 chapters of the book of Acts. Double check my, my study here. It's all just according to scripture. And just look at the church that Jesus uses. It repents, it disciples, it trusts God for his provision, it unifies, it prioritizes biblical ministry, it sees itself in God's covenant plan. It proclaims the gospel wherever it goes, 
and it experiences God-given growth. Now see, now this is my favorite point. Thank you for waiting with me through all this context because what I want you to see is this. Let your fingers do the walking. You ready? Just look at the theme and, and just go with me real quick. Chapter 241. Flip back. We're going to go, we're gonna watch, watch, watch now the, the thread that runs through this whole of this context I've been sharing with you this morning. 241. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. 247. Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord was adding, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Four, four, flip over. Or scroll your screen, whatever you gotta do. Four, four. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Six, one. Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily service of food. But don't miss the context. The disciples were increasing in number. 931. After the apostles, Apostle Paul, known as Saul, is converted in 931, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to what? Increase. 942. When Peter performs a miracle, in 942 it says, it became known all over Joppa and many believed Many believed in the Lord. Look at 1121. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. We read the scriptures way too often with a human centered eye. We read the Bible, and boy, how am I like Peter? I'm not sure anybody's like Peter. We're not an apostle. But what we should be doing is reading the Bible with a God-centered eye. You see, I just read through, look at those passages, 241, 247, 44, 61, 931, 942, 1121, and there's a few more in the book. Who uses this church to grow it? God gives the growth. God's ministry done God's way will have God's provision and will give God's growth. Amen. The church that Jesus uses works faithfully in the fields of the world waiting upon the Lord to give the growth and expects the Holy Spirit to call out servants. In Acts 13, we have the Holy Spirit in the church in Antioch setting apart Barnabas and Paul for missionary service. The church that Jesus uses is the center for worldwide mission. All right. If I have to convince you of this, and if I'm being as biblical as I can possibly be in a short sermon over about 14 chapters of the book of Acts, what I'm really baiting us to do and calling us to do is analyze ourselves upon the mirror of scripture Church, what's the point? Rediscovering God's purpose for his church. Do you realize that there became two centers in the early church of the foundation of the Christian church? Jerusalem and Antioch. And these churches had a primary concern to keep Christ exalted, to study God's word, and to take the gospel to the nations. Missions is not something we do on the side. God's purpose for his church is that he will raise up people within the body who he will then use that body to send those people to, Christ, to, to, to send Christ to the world and so that people who don't know Christ may come to know him. 
From Acts 13 to Acts 28, we follow Paul as he shares the gospel of Jesus Christ in synagogues first, to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. Paul, in the book of Romans, towards the end of the book, I think it's Romans 15, says that he made it his aspiration to share the gospel of Christ where he had not been yet proclaimed. This is apostolic ministry. This is God's purpose for his church. Well, thank you for bearing with me through an overview of nine messages rolled into one. Church, what's the point? In the few messages that will be coming up in the next few weeks, I might share a little bit more about some contemporary stresses and issues that people have in church. But I'm going to ask all of us, whatever generation you're from, whether you're a baby boomer, uh, I'm Gen X. Anybody, anybody else Gen X? Hi, I'm Corey. I'm Generation X. <laughs> anybody millennials? Gen Z? Whatever generation you're from, Let's do this. Let's be the church that Jesus will use. Let's be the church together. Let me close with this thought that goes back to Peter's teaching in the time of Pentecost when they repented. You see, the scripture reads, when they cry out and say to Peter, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized. And then he used a phrase right after that each of you. You see, the church is us gathered together. We're the ecclesia. We're the group. But the command to the individual is to each of you, one by one. I mean, I guess I could try to set the picture this way. Pretend that it's just you and me in the room right now and nobody else is here. What should I do? Repent and be baptized. Turn to Jesus Christ. Don't don't hide in a group. Don't hide behind tradition. Don't hide in a, I'm just a visitor. It is time to proclaim your faith. It is time to know Christ. If you don't know Christ, if you're not a believer yet, if you don't even call yourself a Christian, or let's say you have the label Christian, but you've never been born again. Jesus says in John 3, you must be born again. Repent and be baptized. Align yourself with Christ first, by grace through faith. Do you know Christ? Have you received Christ? Did you hear the message? Jesus is God in the flesh who came to this world, lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, and rose again from the dead. So that all who believe in him from every nation, tribe, or tongue, regardless of the color of your skin or the language you speak, if you hear of Jesus Christ, you receive him as your Lord and Savior, your sin is forgiven. You'll have eternal life in Christ's name. Turn from yourself. Turn from your sin. Turn from, what would Peter say? Your wicked ways. This is what he came for. Repent. Come to Christ. By faith first, And then show the world that you're a Christ follower through your believer's baptism. And then church, let's be the church Jesus uses. Hey, you guys, I'm I'm deathly concerned that people think that the pastor's trying to run an agenda or a program. Y'all, this is not my church. This is Jesus' church. And he wants a church that repents, that is discipled, that trusts God, that is unified, that prioritizes his word and his ministry, that sees itself in his covenant plan, that proclaims the gospel everywhere it goes, and he will give the growth, and he will raise up the servants. He wants to use his church that way. All right? I also need repentance, is what I'm saying. I also need to align my life with Christ, is what I'm saying. Let's all do it together. Okay? Lord Jesus, I pray that you have mercy on us, that you give us strength Oh, Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would reveal unto us the teachings of your word. Jesus, this is your church. You are the head of your church. Your spirit is leading and guiding your church 
to open up to us an understanding of the apostles' teaching contained in your word. Lord, I pray for transformation. I pray that you bring all of us to view your church as you wish it to be. I pray, Lord, that we would not desire personal preferences in our church life, but that we would be willing to be changed to live as you teach us to live, Lord Jesus Christ. That we would die to self and live for Christ. I pray this for individuals in this room. If there's anyone here who does not know Christ as their Savior, oh Lord, draw them by your grace and love. That our only hope of salvation is in you. Scripture says that if anyone confesses that Christ, Jesus is the Christ and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead, they will be saved. For all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord, may we all revisit that. And if there's anyone here who has not ever done that, may they turn to Christ even now. And Lord, I pray for you to do things in this body I pray for you to do things that you alone would get the glory for. That no human being can take any credit for anything that is done. That we would all witness of your spirit working in people's lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.